It gives me a special honor and privilege this morning at this time to welcome today's commencement speaker, Dr. Benjamin Solomon Carson, Sr., United States Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Secretary Carson has a long and distinguished career in medicine and public service. His lifetime of hard work and dedication to helping others, his family, and serving his country make him a shining example of Trine University students and those who he serves. Dr. Carson was confirmed by the United States Senate as the nation's 17th Secretary of Housing and Urban Development on March 2, 2017. Born in Detroit to a single mother with a third grade education who worked multiple jobs to support their family, Secretary Carson was raised to love reading and education. He graduated from Yale University and earned his MD from the University of Michigan Medical School. For nearly 30 years, Dr. Carson served as Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at John Hopkins Children's Center, a position he assumed when he was just 33 years old, becoming the youngest major division director in the hospital's history. In 1987, he successfully performed the first separation of craniopacus twins co-joined at the back of the head. He also performed the first successfully operation and separation of type 2 vertical craniopacus twins in 1997 in South Africa. Secretary Carson has received dozens of honors and awards and recognitions and achievements, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. He's also the recipient of the Spingarn Medal, the highest honor bestowed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Secretary Carson has authored nine books, four of which he co-wrote with his wife, Candy, who happens to be with us this morning. Ms. Carson, would you please stand so we could recognize you? We thank you so much for being with us this morning as well. Secretary Carson and Mrs. Carson co-founded the Carson Scholar Fund, which recognizes young people of all backgrounds and exceptional academic and humanitarian accomplishments. The fund operates in 50 states in the District of Columbia and recognizes more than 7,300 scholars awarding more than $7.3 million in scholarships and installed more than 150 Ben Carson reading rooms around the country. Secretary and Mrs. Carson are proud parents of three sons and three grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and my privilege this morning to welcome the United States Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson, as Trine University's 2018 commencement speaker. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, it is a tremendous honor to be here today. Uh, President Brooks, the distinguished faculty, graduates, trustees, friends, and family, thank you for this invitation. Candy and I are absolutely thrilled to be here and honored to now be part of this university. I heard from uh, Vice President Pence what a great place this was, and uh, now I'm seeing it for myself, and it uh, really is going to be a great honor to forever be linked with you. Graduates, today is without a doubt a singular and consequential moment in your lives, but it's also a bittersweet moment for all of those who've traveled with you from the time of your birth until now as you sprout your wings and begin to fly away. As so many graduates of this university have in the past, you know, I look down the list of accomplishments of uh, Trine University graduates and Tri-State before that, and it really is amazingly impressive. Uh, and I did do my homework, the Molitor golf ball uh, invented by a Trine graduate. It's a real agent of change. And, you know, I've tried to retire several times, but uh, I always fail. 
And, uh, you know, God always seems to have another thing in mind for me. But if I ever get around to, I have a new appreciation for Trine's contributions to the distance of my drive with top flight uh, balls. But uh, I'm hopeful that a, a few lessons uh, from my life are the same kind of lessons that you've learned throughout your lives and throughout your time here at the university. Some of life's greatest struggles lie ahead. But what is important is how you prepare mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally for beautiful times and yet some rugged times with rough waters ahead and how you decide to navigate those rough waters. The only way really to do that is to decide right here and now that you can handle anything that life throws at you. And you will carry with perspective and determination and faith what is needed to achieve full freedom and lasting success. It won't be without bumps in the road. There will be problems, you know, through my long career as a pediatric neurosurgeon, it wasn't all just joy. I remember in the 80s going to the first international conference on human achondroplasia. Uh, achondroplasia is the most common form of dwarfism. And uh, there was a time, at that time, 7% of achondroplastic babies died in infancy. And uh, all the world experts were opining on the treatment of achondroplasts, and then it came my time to speak. Well, the reason that the babies died early on is because of abnormal bony formations at the base of the skull that compressed the brain stem and the respiratory centers. And when people would go in and try to fix it, it was already so tight that they frequently either killed the patient or made them worse. So when it came my time to speak and I talked about a new procedure, surgical procedure we had developed, they were just angry at me. They said, as you surgeons who kill these patients, if you just leave them alone, only 7% of them will die. And uh, they were just not pleased with me at all. But I came back to Baltimore and continued the operation. And then people were complaining to the departmental chairman and to the dean and to the president of the hospital and to the Maryland Medical Society and eventually even to the AMA. Carson's a wild man. You've got to stop him. You know, he's killing people. But by that time, I had done enough of these operations that I was able to reveal the data. That's a very important word, data, evidence. And it, not a single one of them had died. They were all doing well. And in medicine, unlike in politics, evidence actually matters. <laughs> and uh, you know, now that operation is accepted around the world, and achondroplastic babies don't die at a higher rate than anyone else. But you know, it's it's so important to learn from the things that happen, because those are the things that really will determine who you are and what you accomplish. And there have been many, and there will be in your lives, many flexion points. And it will determine the trajectory of your life, how you react to that. I remember as a youngster, how I reacted to ridicule. I was ridiculed a lot, because I was a terrible student. I was what's called a safety net. Nobody had to worry about getting the, the lowest mark as long as I was there. And uh, I remember once we were having an argument about who was the dumbest kid in the class. And it wasn't a big argument. They all agreed it was me. But then they, the argument extended to who was the dumbest person in the school and then to the dumbest person in the world. And I said, wait a minute, there are billions of people in the world. And they said, and you're the dumbest one. But... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I did have a way of getting back at my classmates because I was good at one thing in particular, and that was getting other people kicked out of class. I was an expert at, because I would study my classmates and figure out what made them really, really angry. And then I would just irritate them and irritate them until they were about to explode. 
Never pushed the last button to make them explode until they were in class and the teacher was nearby. And then I'd do it, they would explode, the teacher would kick them out, and I'd say, yeah, this is great, because I wouldn't be the only one who didn't learn anything that day. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but there was this one girl. Now, you all know this girl. Some of you were this girl. Miss Goody Two-Shoes. You know, everything perfect, pristine, on time, and everybody else looked like a total jerk. I said, wouldn't it be great to get her kicked out of class? So, but the problem was she was so cool, calm, and collected, you couldn't get under her skin. But I was persistent, and I finally figured out what irritated her, and I tell you, she was steaming. I mean, the ears were coming out, she was about to explode, but I didn't push the last button. I waited till we were in class. Lo and behold, she sat right down in the desk in front of me. I said, the Lord is good. And uh, as the teacher approached, I started irritating her. I pushed the last button, but she didn't explode. She just quietly, calmly turned around and said, you and me on the playground at recess. <laughs> so that didn't work out. But, uh, but I learned from that, too. I learned stop irritating people. It was a good thing. But, you know, we all face unfairness sometimes. And how do we react to the unfairness? You will experience unfairness in your life. You know, when I was in the eighth grade at Wilson Junior High School, I was, I was the only black student in eighth grade class. And uh, I had turned things around very significantly academically by that time. You know, my mother, who only had a third grade education, came from a huge rural family, got married at age 13, then years later discovered her husband was a bigamist. But, you know, she was a determined person, and she was determined that I was not going to be a failure or my brother. And she prayed to God for wisdom, too. And she got it. And it was to make us turn off the TV and read books, two books apiece from the Detroit Public Libraries every week and submit to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she would put little check marks and underlines and highlights and stuff, you know. But, you know, that's what really turned me around academically. So by the eighth grade, I was doing really well. And there was a special award for the highest academic achievement. And I thought I was in the running for that. And uh, you take your report card around, all the teachers would mark your report card, and I had all A's, and I got to the very last class, which was band. And I figured I was a cinch to get an A in band, because I was very good, uh, if I do say so myself. <laughs> And uh, in fact, I subsequently won a scholarship to Interlock, and those of you in music know what that means. But um, he gave me a C because he wanted to ruin my report card because I was the only black student. But to his chagrin, it turns out band didn't count, so I won the award anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that taught me don't get bitter, just do what's right and continue forward. God will take care of the situation, and he did. And then, what about the pressure to give up? What about all the people you will run into who say, you can't do that, no one's done that, you should give up. Well, you know, as a first year medical student at the University of Michigan, I did horribly on the first set of comprehensive exams so badly that my advisor advised me to drop out of medical school. He said, you're not cut out for medicine. You're going to torture yourself and everybody else. Why don't you just quit? I was devastated. It was the only thing I ever wanted to do since I was eight years old. And now the person who's supposed to help me get through says, drop out. And I went back to my apartment and just said, Lord, you got to help me. I was thinking about how embarrassing it was, how disappointed my mother and everybody else would be. And then it occurred to me to analyze your academic performance. And I said, what kind of courses have I always struggled with and what kind of courses have I always done very well in? And I realized that I did well in classes where I did a lot of reading and I struggled 
when I had to listen to a lot of boring lectures. And there I was listening to six to eight hours worth of boring lectures every day. So I made the executive decision to skip the boring lectures and to spend that time reading. And the rest of medical school was a snap after that. And years later when I came back to my medical school as the commencement speaker, I was looking for that advisor because I was going to tell him he wasn't cut out to be an advisor. <laughs> Because, you know, there are so many people, they're just negative, negative, negative. They can always tell you why something can't work, but they never seem to be able to tell you why things can work. Please don't be one of those people. You all are going to have significant spheres of influence. And using those in a positive way will make a tremendous difference for our nation. Well, you know, I find that sometimes in your life you're asking yourself, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And I remember some years ago being a very successful surgeon, but I was sitting on the board of directors of the Kellogg Company, Costco Wholesale Company, some others as well, and I was saying, Lord, what this is not something that surgeons ever do. There are no surgeons on these boards. What, why am I here? I mean, it was nice. It was fun. You made a lot of money. It was great. But I couldn't figure out why that was happening in my life. That is, until I was nominated to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, a huge place with a multitude of people, and complex budgets, all of which I had learned about on the boards of Kellogg and Costco. The point being, sometimes you may find yourself in different situations, you don't understand exactly why, but maybe you're being prepared for something else. You never know what it is that you're being prepared for. And in my role as Secretary of HUD, you know, there are ample opportunities to apply these lessons. You know, some people have said, why after a successful medical career would you go into government? And sometimes I ask myself that too. But, uh, but you know, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I spent so much time, sometimes operating all night long, to try to give a small kid a second chance at life. And most of the time, we were successful, only to find myself, in many cases, sending them back into a horrible environment. Rats, roaches, lead, mold, bed bugs. And it was awful, and I didn't want to send them back. And sometimes I would actually order extra tests so they could stay in the hospital an extra day. Don't tell anybody. but. Uh, but now, as Secretary of HUD, there's an opportunity to actually do something about it and complete that circle. And there's an opportunity to actually change things, to change that bureaucracy to something that works effectively so that instead of just focusing on putting people into programs and how many people we can get in a program and how much money we can spend on it, we can actually spend time figuring out how to get people out of poverty because it's the development of our people that's our most precious resource. We only have 330 million people in this country. Compare that to China and India, they have four times that many people. And we need to develop all of our people if we're going to be able to compete successfully. That's going to be the key to success for us, as is my final word to you, my philosophy for success in life, which is to think big. Each one of those letters means something special, the T for talent, which God gave to every single person, not just the ability to sing and dance, but intellectual talent, which will be the key to our success as a nation. The H is for honesty. Lead a clean and honest life. Because if you don't put skeletons in the closet, they can't come back out to haunt you later. People may accuse you of all kinds of skeletons, but you don't have to worry because you know there's no skeletons there. The N 
is for nice. Be nice to people. Because once they get over the suspicion of why you're being nice, they'll be nice to you. And you can get so much more done when you're being nice and they're being nice. And it is really essential that your generation understand this. You know, my generation has failed. And uh, we have got to change course. You know, we have a situation in this country now where we have mean, hateful people trying to drive wedges into every demographic, race, income, age, religion, gender, you name it, driving a wedge, getting people to get into their respective corners and to hate each other rather than using our collective knowledge and skills for the betterment of our country. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus said it and it was re re-echoed by Abraham Lincoln. And it is absolutely true. No nation that divides itself has ever been successful, never will be successful. And it will be you and your generation that will determine the fate of our nation. The K is for knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the more valuable you become. Many have said that for your generation, you graduates, most of you will have somewhere between three and five careers. That transition will be a lot easier if you're already very knowledgeable. The B is for books, which is the mechanism for obtaining that knowledge. And you know, it's, it's never too late. My mother did eventually teach herself to read, got her GED, went on to college. In 1994, got an honorary doctorate degree, so she ended up being Dr. Carson too. So you know, it's never too late. And the, uh, the second I, the second I is for in-depth learning. You know, having that knowledge that is deep really gives you a lot of freedom, as opposed to the superficial learners. Those are people who cram, cram, cram before a test, sometimes do okay, and three weeks later know nothing. I'm sure none of you know anyone like that. But you know, we can't really afford that as we go forward into this age of information and technology. And finally, the last letter, G, is for God. A lot of people trying to kick God out of our society. You know, when I became the secretary, I was told by a high-level person that you're the head of a government agency now. You have to stop all this talk about God. And I said, that's not going to happen. And you know, people who say things like that, what do they know about this nation and its beginnings? Do they realize that our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain unalienable rights given to us by our creator, AKA God? Do they realize that the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag says we are one nation under God? Do they realize that many courtrooms on the wall, it says, in God we trust, Every coin in your pocket, every bill in your wallet says, in God we trust. So if it's in our family document, it's in our pledge, it's in our courts, it's on our money, but we're not supposed to talk about it, what in the world is that? In medicine, it's called schizophrenia. And uh, <laughs> doesn't that, <laughs> doesn't that, doesn't that explain a lot of what's going on in our nation today? And we need to make it perfectly clear that it's okay to live by godly principles of loving your fellow man, caring about your neighbor, developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you become valuable to the people around you, having values and principles that govern your life. If you do that, not only will we remain a great nation, but we will truly have one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Congratulations, go out and conquer the world, God bless.
Thank you so much, Secretary Carson. Trine University follows a long established academic practice of recognizing through the granting of honorary degrees those distinguished individuals who have made substantial contribution to their fields of work. We have the privilege today of recognizing one such outstanding individual, Dr. Benjamin Solomon Carson, Sr. I ask Dr. Alan Herschel, our Vice President for Academic Affairs, and Secretary Carson to come forward and join me at the podium as we award the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters. By virtue of the laws of the state of Indiana and the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Trine University, by direction of trustees and upon the recommendation of the faculty, I am pleased to confer upon you the honorary degree Doctor of Humane Letters with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto, and in testimony whereof, we invest you with this hood, and I present you with this diploma. Congratulations, Dr. Carson. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please recognize Secretary and Mrs. Carson. Thank you so much for being with us.